Hi, it's a privilege to be here and I'm delighted to be able to share my research. The title of my talk is the Codicological Observations on a Chan Manuscript from Tun Huang. And I specifically focus on one manuscript, that is S5475 with the Platform Sutra. This is a manuscript that has been studied extensively uh, since its discovery. It is one of the key manuscripts for the study of early Chan, primarily because it contains what is often claimed to be the earliest copy of the Platform Sutra. Originally, the manuscript comes from the Dunhuang Library Cave and was acquired at Dunhuang in 1907 by Oral Stein and was subsequently transported to London and deposited at the British Museum, where it became part of the Stein collection. Following the establishment of the British Library in 1973, the manuscript, along with the other manuscripts of the Stein collection, was transferred to the library and it remains there to this day. The text of the Platform Sutra was first identified by Yabuki Keiki in 1923, when the manuscript was still at the British Museum. The other Dunhuang versions of the Platform Sutra are kept in other collections. So Dunbo 77 from the Dunhuang City Museum is in a codex form, similar to the Stein manuscript. Here we see an image and the beginning of the text. Another copy is on the verso of scroll BD4548 from the National Library of China. There's also a small fragment at the National Library of China with only four and a half lines of text. And this was cataloged as BD8958. And finally, there is the Lushun Museum copy, which is a codex and it was considered lost for several decades, but has recently been found again. This is the only manuscript that is dated, and although the date is not appended directly to the Platform Sutra, but to the text that follows it, and the date is 958. So, of these Dunhuang copies, three are in a codex form, and only two are in a scroll form. The Stein manuscript has been studied extensively from the point of view of the textual history of the text. It has been the text translated into English by Philip Jan Polsk in 1967, and it remained at the center of all latest studies. In recent years, Christopher Andel has done an analysis of the text from a linguistic and paleographic perspective, contributing new insight to our understanding of the text's history and the dialect that was probably used by the copyists. This paper continues along this line of inquiry and tries to use codicological analysis to recover additional details that may help us to learn more about the date of the manuscript and also the circumstances of its production and subsequent use. In this paper, I will focus only on two aspects. The first is the date and I'll try to see if I can find additional information. And the other aspect I want to focus on is the use of the manuscript. Specifically, I will focus on this note on the spine of the manuscript, which has, to my knowledge, has not been noted before. So let's move on to the date of the manuscript. So although there's been quite a bit of scholarship on the Dunhuang version of the Platform Sutra, including this Stein copy, there seems to be no consensus regarding the date. Jan Polsky considered it the earliest manuscript of the text, dating between 830 or 860, and he based this dating on Fujiera Akira's assessment of the calligraphic style, because Professor Fujiera was able to look at the manuscript using photographs. More than 20 years later, Morten Schluter suggested that it had been copied during the early part of the 9th century. And interestingly, he also referred to personal communication with Professor Fujieda, who observed that the manuscript was written with a wooden pen, which was common during the period when Dunhuang was under Tibetan control. In a later study, Schluter dated the manuscript to around 780, although in making this statement, he seems to have been referring to the date of the composition of the text rather than the manuscript. 
in their study of the Tunhuang Museum copy of the Platform Sutra. Deng Wenquan and Rong Xingjiang looked at textual and phonological evidence and came to the conclusion that both manuscripts were probably copied during the Cao family's rule of Tunhuang, that is from 914 to about 1002. John Jorgensen accepted this view, and as I will argue below, I also think that this dating makes the most sense. The Stein manuscript is in a codex form and is therefore part of the approximately 400 codices or booklets from Dunhuang. So although statistically this is a small number compared to the tens of thousands of other manuscripts, nevertheless they're quite important from the point of view of the history of the Chinese book and also the eastward spread of the codex. So like codices in the west, the Stein manuscript consists of folded by folia, stacked together into choirs or gatherings. And here we can see how this is done. The choirs are sewn together with a thread. It is not clear whether this red thread is actually the original thread or was added by modern conservators, but in any case the sewing holes make it very clear that the manuscript was in this form even before any potential modern intervention. Structurally, the manuscript consists of 13 choirs, and each of these choirs is made of two bifolia. And so these bifolia are basically just these sheets of paper which are folded into half, and they're sewn together along the center. It is a bit unusual that there are quite a few choirs, but each choir only contains two bifolia. Because here you have 13 choirs, and normally you would only have like two or three, but each one of those would consist of four, six, or eight bifolia. And here it's the other way around, so you have quite a few choirs, but each of these is relatively small. It is also quite interesting that the pages themselves are very long, and they resemble the shape of poti leaves, and even their corners are rounded or beveled, which also is similar to poti leaves. The poti leaves in general, they seem to signify some connection with Tibetan scribal culture, and here this might also be the case. The front and back covers are empty, and actually the first choir is completely empty. On the front cover you see these sujo numerals, which were added by Stein's Chinese secretary in 1907, and if I read correctly the number is 85. And this was uh, part of his initial effort to create an inventory of the manuscripts. The poti shape of pages makes the manuscript part of a much smaller group of codices from Dunhuang. So there are not so many poti shaped codices, and they form a, a very distinct group. And as I said, this might be related to Tibetan scribal culture. But the presence of these Tibetan traits doesn't mean that the manuscript can be dated to the Tibetan period, that is from 786 to 848, because Tibetan presence remains strong in Dunhuang even after the end of their political control of the region. So culturally, Tibetans did not really leave Dunhuang. In fact, most such manuscripts were likely produced during the Guiyijun period in Dunhuang. In Dunhuang, the codex form has a strong temporal dimension, because all dated examples come from the 10th century. Not many of them are dated, but the ones there are come from the 10th century. And so I think it is quite likely that the non-dated ones would also come from the 10th century. It's possible that there might be exceptional examples from a little bit earlier, but based on the dated examples, I think we would be justified to say that the manuscript is more likely to be from the 10th century. This, of course, does not mean that the text cannot be earlier, but this particular copy is likely from the 10th century. And the 10th century becomes even more plausible because we don't just have one copy of this text in the codex form, but there are three of them, and it is not likely that they would be very much apart in time. So I think with three codices, it's quite unlikely that they would come from before the 10th century. Here you can see the spine, how the choirs are sewn together uh, using this red thread. So it's possible that the thread is new, but probably is replacing an original one that was there. And even though this manuscript does not have a colophon, 
there is a note written on the spine of the manuscript. This way of writing on the spine was not very common, but occasionally can be seen on Dunhuang codices. So the characters are difficult to read, but the last two seem to be writing the word Wen Shu, that is manuscript. So even though these characters are barely legible, there are other examples from Dunhuang which contain notes added by owners of users of manuscripts to assert their ownership. For example, there's scroll S395, which contains the text called Kongzi Xiang Tuo Xiang Wan Shu, and it has a colophon stating that the text was copied in 943 by the lay student Zhang Yanbao, who studied at the Pure Land Monastery. The verse of the scroll has quite a bit of miscellaneous content, and these at first sight appear chaotic and random. Amidst this miscellaneous content, we find a note saying Zhang Yanbao Wen Shu Bu Luan Ren Qu, probably Er. Although the grammar of the second half is problematic, the first half clearly states that this is a manuscript in use by Zhang Yanbao, the very same student who copied the main text on the recto. Just to cite another example, manuscript S5529 is in the codex form and contains the same text, identified at the very beginning by the title as Kongzi Xiang Tuo Xiang Wen Shu. And although there is no colophon in the manuscript identifying the person who copied the text, on the front of the booklet we find the following three lines of text. Long Wen Sheng Wen Shu Ce Zi, Long Yan Chang Wen Shu, and Long Yan Sheng Wen Shu. In the first line, we have a more specific reference to the manuscript as a Wen Shu Ce Zi, so a booklet manuscript. And the other two lines use the term Wen Shu for naming this particular codex. These two examples demonstrate that this term Wen Shu could be used for both scrolls and codices. Also, the person who is marked as owning or using the manuscript was not necessarily the person who copied it, because we have evidence of only one hand inside the booklet. These two examples are but two of a group of Dunhuang manuscripts with similar notes, in which someone, often a student, asserts his ownership over a manuscript. Perhaps the ownership is only temporary because in time others may take charge of the same manuscript. So these cases make it likely that the two characters we see here are in fact Wen Shu, and we have a similar note to that seen in other manuscripts. What comes before it must be a name, but unfortunately it's not very visible. I'm tempted to read this as Mo, and then this one as maybe Cheng or Liang, but I'm not sure. But for the second character, I cannot even guess. And of course, not being able to read the name is unfortunate, because that way we could have connected the manuscript with others, and perhaps even dated more precisely. But still, just by recognizing the word Wen Shu on the spine, we can connect it with other manuscripts that feature similar notes. Of the more than a dozen examples I have been able to identify as containing such notes, Eight use the term Wen Shu rather than Juan or Ce Zi, and four of these are dated unambiguously using reign titles. And these dates range from 921 to 943. And of course, the sample base is too small for a reliable comparison with the Stein manuscript, yet it is significant that the examples confirm the 10th century dating suggested by the codex form. And also by being able to connect the Stein manuscript to the other cases with notes of ownership, we can make a number of observations about the way the booklet may have been used. First, the very fact that it had such a note tells us that it remained in use after the text was copied. In other words, the text was not simply copied for the sake of accruing merit, as we often suppose the case with some manuscripts was, but it continued to be used long after it was initially produced. And second, the manuscript was probably connected with learning, as it is suggested by the fact that most manuscripts with such notes are in some way or other linked to students. Students did not just read the manuscript, but kept it for longer periods of time, engaging with it in a variety of ways that went beyond simply reading it. They could have memorized parts of it, copied out entire sections, 
or even used its language to construct their own arguments. So looking at the manuscript from this perspective allows us to reconsider the presence of a multitude of scribal mistakes and idiosyncrasies noted by virtually every scholar who had studied the manuscript. Because these characteristics are entirely consistent with other Dunhuang manuscripts written by students, many of which have colophons expressly stating that they were copied by students. So it does not have to be the case that this was a hasty record of a lecture after hearing, or that the person who copied it was not very well educated. Perhaps in a sense he was not educated, but simply because he was still learning. And so my conclusions are actually quite simple. From the point of view of the form of the book, that is the codex form, it seems that it's better to look at it as a 10th century manuscript. And this would of course be true for the other copies that are in codex form. That is the copies kept at the Tunhuang Museum and the Lushun Museum. And so the second observation discussed here was this presence of an ownership note on the spine, which connects the manuscript with other ones with similar notes. And manuscripts with such notes were typically copied and owned by students, which makes it likely that this was also true for the Stein manuscript. On the one hand, this provides an explanation for the presence of scribal mistakes, but on the other, it also changes how we understand the function of this manuscript. Because if it was indeed owned and used by a student, then its primary function probably would have been educational. Thank you.